welcome Friends of Union to tonight's lecture and conversation with Dr. Eric Darrell Meyer. Before proceeding to our introduction, I'd like to begin as I always do uh, by acknowledging that I come to you uh, from the unceded traditional lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples here in Victoria, British Columbia. And our host institution for the day, Union Theological Seminary, is in Manhattan, uh, which is uh, located on the lands of the Lenape people. As always, um, as we begin to talk about questions of theology and animality, we begin by recognizing that all these lands and our creaturely kin have long been in the care of others whom we acknowledge with respect and from whom we seek to learn. My name is John Tatominal. I direct the Insight Project at Union Theological Seminary. The Insight Project is sustained by the generosity of Union alumnus Mary Coelho. The project seeks to think theology in robust and interdisciplinary conversation with the sciences broadly construed and to deepen theological reflection by bringing the field into conversation with themes that are often rendered marginal to theology. Our conversations have and will bring to Union's attention themes such as nature, place, and this year our ongoing conversation on animals and, and animality. Just to say a quick word about our format, um, our speaker, Dr. Meyer, will speak for about 25 minutes then he and I will have um, a bit of a conversation. And then uh, we hope to have at least 15 minutes for fielding your questions in the Q&A box. Um, that'll probably happen around seven o'clock. And then we hope to wrap up by 7.15. Now, let me uh, introduce our guest. It really does give me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Eric Darrell Meyer. Professor Meyer teaches at Carroll College. I think a case can be made that Professor Meyer may well have the best and most singular job title that I've ever seen. He is the Gregory Robin and Susan Raunig Professor of Social Justice and the Human Animal Relationship. What a, what a lovely title. Of course, the fact that Dr. Meyer might well be the only person anywhere who holds a professorship in human-animal relationship gives us much to think about, not necessarily to be happy about. After all, few topics are of such importance to planetary survival and well-being in this age of mass extinctions, and yet few topics are so great grossly neglected, which is why I'm so very grateful to have him with us and um, especially to engage him about his fine book, Inner Animalities, Theology and the End of the Human, which was published in 2018 by Fordham University Press. As it happens, Fordham University is also where Dr. Meyer did his doctoral studies. Dr. Meyer grew up in the mountains of Colorado as a theologian with strong interests in land, wild places, and ecological degradation, his research focuses on all the ways that the Christian theological tradition draws boundaries between human beings and non-human animals. At Carroll College, he offers a range, a really remarkable range of courses, from ecological theology to healthcare ethics to animality and humanity in the Catholic tradition. I'd love to take some of these courses. Outside of the academic world, he has worked in wilderness education, environmental advocacy, and outdoor recreation for over a decade, including a few years in Montana as a member of a ski patrol and a wildland fire crew. As you can see, he brings with him a rich and embodied set of experiences to his theological work. I think you can begin to see now why I'm so excited to welcome Eric to Union Theological Seminary and to this Inside Project event. Welcome, Eric. We are excited and delighted to hear you. 
Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it is, uh, it's a joy and an honor to be here. Um, I am in Helena, Montana at Carroll College, a small Catholic diocesan liberal arts college. Um, and I should say that uh, Carroll College is on lands that traditionally supported the Salish uh, and Blackfeet people um, uh, from whom uh, we have a lot to learn. Thank you uh, to everyone who's here, especially. Um, I think this is the most people I have ever had in my office with me at one time. I hope it doesn't feel too crowded to you all. Um, but thank you especially uh, to Dr. Thetamanil uh, to the Inside Project and the generosity of, of Mary Coelho. It's a, it's a joy to be with you today. Let me call up PowerPoint. There we go. So um, today, what I would like to do with the talk portion or the lecture portion of uh, our program this evening is talk through the, the origins and the theory uh, behind uh, the book project, Inner Animalities, uh, Theology and the End of the Human. Um, that will be a little bit more on the theoretical end. I'm, I'm uh, excited to talk about the, theologic, the theological moves and arguments uh, in the book uh, in conversation with Dr. Patamanil and in the Q&A afterwards, but this is gonna focus a little bit more on the skeleton of the project. Um, this project had its origins uh, in my work as a wilderness guide and an environmental advocate um, or work in advocacy, thinking about ecological degradation, species extinction, the loss of wildlands, uh, the encroachment of uh, urban and suburban sprawl on, on wild places uh, and, how, and how to respond and, and feeling like our, um, all of the range of responses that we have are, are inadequate. Um, and as I had those feelings, I noticed similar feelings uh, or similar intuitions uh, in many others. So, Tracing back, you know, as I would read uh, environmentalists and ecological theologians uh, over and over again, whatever analysis, whatever particular analysis they offered, uh, very often the conclusion of these works came around to a call for a sort of large scale cultural transformation. So in many ways, Lynn White's essay, The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis is the sort of uh, uh, thorn in the side that produces ecological theology. And, and his conclusion is that we need a, a different kind of culture, that Western culture, so problematic in its um, consumption and uh, extractive exploitation of the earth, uh, has its roots in Christian theology or Christian worldview. And since the roots of the problem are, he says, so largely religious, the remedy must also be essentially religious, whether or not we call it that. And he's uh, open to some, uh, he's open to calling it something else. Um, oh, let's see, I lost one here. No, I'll go back. Okay. Oh, there it is. Uh, William Cronin, another sort of uh, major essay within environmentalism. Uh, ends up making a similar point. He's arguing about the division between nature and culture, uh, but is looking for a sort of transformation of human culture, uh, especially Western culture, that would allow us to be at home in the world rather than divided from it. Uh, um, and more recently, and this is um, uh, not a, uh, not a quote that was at the origins of the project, but one with which it very much resonates. Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si, uh, now six years old, uh, makes what is uh, a very surprising uh, call for, for a Pope. Um, so he's calling for an ecological culture, uh, a response to our environmental problems that's more than a Band-Aid on the solution, that's more than a reactionary, uh, Band-Aid on uh, pollution um, 
uh, loss of biodiversity, um, climate change, all of those things. If we're, if we're only seeking a technical remedy, if we're only sort of recycling our way into the apocalypse, we're not, uh, we're not responding adequately to the scale of the crisis. And so here at the end of this quote, all of this shows, he says, the urgent need for us to move forward in a bold cultural revolution. And it, uh, the, especially the term cultural revolution always catches my attention given the, the Catholic Church's uh, the institutional Catholic Church's historic antagonism towards uh, communism and the resonances of that phrase. And I, and I don't think that Pope Francis is trying to rehabilitate the, the cultural revolution in China, but uh, is using that, using that language that what we need is a sort of revolution in our, in our culture. Um, and as I encountered this call for a sort of massive uh, large scale cultural transformation, it seemed to me that by and large, uh, the work being done or the kinds of work being done in ecological theology was, was largely inadequate to that task or was uh, doing really good and important work but wasn't getting at the, getting at the root. And so I was uh, searching for a different way uh, to approach uh, ecological theology. Uh, and through conversation came to the conclusion that focusing in on the human animal relationship, the boundary between human beings and other animals uh, in a theoretic, theoretically careful and sophisticated way might actually, be, um, uh, might actually be adequate to doing that work or that, that this, the seeds of a cultural transformation might be found there in the, the human animal relationship in the human animal binary. Um, so mainstream Christian theology has a long standing habit. We can find exceptions, but mainstream Christian theology uh, almost overwhelmingly endorses what we could call anthropological exceptionalism. And that's the idea that human beings as a category uh, can be uh, distinguished from animals as a category and separated from them. And exceptionalism means that human beings are not only sort of categorically different than all other animals taken together, but are more important than or better than or more valuable than all other animals taken together as a category. Uh, and with very few exceptions, although they're important and we can find them, uh, Christian theology, mainstream Christian theology in any tradition that we might look at, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, has endorsed uh, one form or another of anthropological exceptionalism. Um, so this is a long-standing habit of thought. And I wanna start one sort of crack or one place to start here is notice that uh, the term animal um, does a lot of work for us. Uh, we use it as a tool, but I think in some ways it's also a trap for our thought. Um, because when we say animal, we're summing up or enclosing uh, an astounding range of creatures. And I think Brianne Donaldson, uh, who spoke uh, to the class uh, earlier or in an earlier event, uh, uh, brought, this, brought this idea out. But uh, animal can mean an eel, an emu, an elephant, uh, a penguin um, uh, or a shark, and you know, what do those, what do those, a worm, what do those creatures have in common that hold, binds them together as a category? Uh, very, very little, but we have this term that is supposed to sort of encompass all of them, and we use it to differentiate ourselves from all, all the others. Uh, now, the Anthropological exceptionalism, the idea that human beings are categorically different from and uh, more important than all other animals, um, requires some account of what human beings have in common and what uh, animals also have in common with one another. And so there is a, a second distinction that's implied within this first distinction between human beings and animals. And that's a distinction between the sort of the, the qualities that make up humanity, um, what it is that makes humans human, and the qualities that make up animality, 
what it is that makes animals animal. Uh, and so in the discourse, or as people try to separate human beings from all other animals, it's helpful to attend to the concepts, the terms, the attributes, the skills, the capacities uh, that, that different authors uh, use to make this division. Say all animals are uh, speechless, all animals are stupid, all animals are unfree, they're unable to think, um, they're instinctual, whatever it might be. Um, so uh, this makes it clear, I think, especially as we look historically, that humanity is a discourse as much as it is a species name. It, it's a conversation, it's a production, it's a way that we name ourselves to ourselves. And we do that in contrast with what we call an animality, um, uh, a set of qualities that we attribute to the creatures that we call animals. But that's always an ongoing project. And a scholar whose work has been very influential on my thought here, uh, Giorgio Agamben, an Italian philosopher, uh, in a book called The Open, refers to this as the anthropological machine. That when we want to do anthropological exceptionalism, when we buy into it, we're having to always produce humanity. We're having to always sort of reinforce uh, the distinction between uh, humanity and animality and come up with the concepts, capacities uh, that, that make that separation. Um, Okay. So within my book, I suggest that this generates uh, what I want to call the problem of human animality. And that is that as much as we would like to distinguish ourselves or traditionally have distinguished ourselves from all other animals, there are lots of ways in which we are always undeniably one animal among many others. Uh, we're mammals who have to eat and breathe and sleep and stay warm. We have more commonalities with other animals than we would like to think. And that causes problems or questions for anthropological exceptionalism. If we're supposed to be in an entirely separate category from all other animals, then our own animality, the, the attributes and capacities that we share with other creatures become a kind of conceptual problem for us. Um, and so a theology that's committed to anthropological exceptionalism uh, has to come up with strategies for explaining, uh, managing, and uh, working around human animality. And the Christian tradition has been extraordinarily creative and generative in these strategies. Um, uh, anything from spiritualities that work to tame and control our inner animalities or uh, uh, put our desires and urges in bondage. Uh, Paul at one point says, I beat my body to make it my slave. That's a metaphor of uh, constraint. He, he feels like he has to control his, his body. Uh, language of sacrifice, language of sul sublimation, redirection, cultivation, totemization. There's all kinds of different strategies that Christians have used to manage, explain away, subordinate our own human animality in order to be able to continue to hold to uh, anthropological exceptionalism, the, the idea that we are categorically different from and better than, more important than all other animals. Um, and so uh, a lot of my work has been uh, paying attention to those strategies and thinking with them, and especially uh, around the sort of tensions and contradictions that those strategies produce within Christian theology. So coming back to Agamben's anthropological machine, uh, this task of naming the attributes, uh, and the capacities that make human beings human and the attributes and capacities or lack thereof that make animals animals is, a, is always a sort of ongoing project, is always requires reinforcing, 
Uh, and um, the problem of human animality is that human beings are, it, it feels like a slippery slope. We're always on the verge of sliding back into our common animality. And so the anthropological machine is this task of uh, naming ourselves to ourselves over and over again. And I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about how that works or what that means. That, that project, that cultural project of naming ourselves as different from all the other animals is we can either start from the individual or we can start from the sort of cultural or structural side. It's a long-standing tradition that forms individuals to think of themselves as different from all the other animals and to live uh, in distinction or contrast from all the other animals. Uh, and enforce that uh, upon others. So individuals sort of perform humanity or live into our ideals of humanity. And when we do that well, we are rewarded socially uh, and continue to do that. Um, and when we fail and when we slip into our animality, we're, we're often punished. Um, I use in the early pages of the book, every six-year-old knows what it means uh, to be asked, were you born in a barn uh, or you're eating like an animal? Um, we all know that we're not supposed to do that, that we're supposed to be different. And so we perform uh, human difference and we enforce it on one another. And so the second point here is that our notions of humanity are produced it's this ongoing cultural project that we take up as individuals, but it's normative, meaning um, there's a measure that we're expected to measure up to, that a standard that we're held to, and there's discipline involved. When we fail, we're, uh, we're punished. When we're, when we're successful, when we embody humanity in the right way, re we reward one another. And it's all based on a sort of hierarchy. Uh, the people who do humanity the best end up on top of the hierarchy, uh, and the people who uh, fail uh, are often subordinated. But this project, because it's a project, because it's a task, looks really different at different times and places. And the, the particular attributes that we use to name humanity or animality are not the same in fourth century Turkey uh, or Asia Minor as they are uh, in the present. I think the project, there's a kind of continuity in that the project or the anthropological machine keeps on running, but it can do it with different, it can operate with different terms, with different ideas, with different understandings of animality and humanity. So here's a little bit of a tighter representation of the anthropological machine. Um, again, I'm drawing heavily on Giorgio Agamben, although I think there's uh, ways in which I'm going to push him a little bit in a moment, drawing on some other scholars. But this is a, a way of representing both the anthropological machine and the problem of human animality in some sense. So on the left, you see uh, a grab bag of different qualities that have been used in the history of theology and philosophy to name sort of the, uh, what is most and properly human about human beings. Well, it's in our freedom. It's in the fact that we can, that we can speak. It's in our rationality and our understanding of the world. And on the right, there are the qualities that are the sort of inverse or opposite of those other qualities. Oh, what do animals have in common? Well, they're all driven by instinct or they're merely bodies in the world. They don't have consciousness or they, uh, they're not truly free. They don't make moral decisions, et cetera. The problem of uh, human animality emerges here in that because this is a project, because the column on the, the left are norms for which uh, individuals are rewarded when they live up to or embody those characteristics and the column on the right are things for which there's sort of social sanction. Um, we're all stuck to one degree or another in the middle in this sort of zone of indistinction, a place uh, 
where it's unclear if we're as human as we ought to be or whether we're sliding down the slippery slope back into animality. But there's a place within every life, within human life generally, where uh, humanity and animality, there's no clean border between the two, that there's a sort of fuzzy place of, of indistinction uh, between the two. One way of thinking about that is that there are ways in which each of us is human, but not fully human, or we're imperfectly human, at least according to the disciplinary norms and standards that are often imposed. Um, and historically, um, the place of myth and stories and imaginative uh, bestiaries uh, does some of this work. Agamben calls attention to uh, conversations about centaurs um, and uh, homunculi and other sort of mythical human animal hybrid creatures uh, and suggests that those are ways of doing the anthropological machine, defining using this sort of indistinct boundary between the two to help reinforce norms of humanity. Um, so this zone of indistinction is a sort of space of the uncanny where uh, we're never quite sure if we're being human enough or if we're sliding back into animality. So, as, but as I notice, and this is a way, this is a point at which Agamben is not as careful as he should be and has been called to account um, helpfully by a number of scholars. We, we're not all, threatened or uh, we don't all occupy the zone of indistinction in the, in the same way. Um, we're not all left behind in the, the project to embody a sort of ideal humanity to the same degree and in the same way. And so th these normative accounts of humanity uh, end up uh, alongside in and through uh, other norms reinforcing uh, intra-human hierarchies. And this is something that I've seen a lot more clearly since writing the book and is, is not very well reflected, I think, or not as well reflected in the book as I would like it to be. So for one example of many, um, within Western culture, indigenous peoples are represented as in stereotypes, um, in mainstream thinking and certainly in action as people who are caught in this zone of indistinction. They're human like us, but not as human as uh, Western uh, European descended people. They're uh, culturally associated with qualities that get associated with animality uh, and it, I've listed a, a selection of um, scholars and thinkers who have helped me see that. So George Tinker, Fine Deloria, Eduardo Cohn, Eduardo Vivieros de Castro. And I'm happy to provide book titles if that would be helpful. Similarly, along uh, the lines of racialization, white, white supremacist thought operates within and through the anthropological machine to think race. Uh, uh, one way of thinking about race is that it creates a kind of gradient of humans that are more human or less human than others. Uh, and in the world that we inhabit, um, uh, or I'll say it differently, we inhabit a white supremacist world where in, in point of fact, what counts as human is stereotypically white uh, and all others are, uh, stereotypically uh, kept or uh, uh, left in the zone of indistinction to a greater degree, or have to sort of prove, uh, have to work against the grain of, of, of bias to prove that they're as human as, uh, as everyone else. Uh, similarly, in coloniality, so Sylvia Winter and Franz Fanon use the language of dehumanization and uh, uh, help sort of uh, fill color in the lines that Agamben is not very attentive to. Uh, and in, in disability studies, I can't recommend highly enough the work of Nellie Chen, 
or Sonara Taylor, both of whom attend to the ways that uh, differently embodied uh, human beings um, whose capacities don't um, align with um, social norms uh, are assimilated in discourse to the qualities of animality and, and again are left uh, within this zone of indistinction. And gender uh, works in very similar ways uh, as well. And Val Plumwood, Carol Adams, and uh, again, Zakia Iman Jackson uh, are very helpful thinkers here. Um, I want to uh, pay attention, or I want to use this quote from Jackson to clarify something that I that I think is uh, really important here, that. Uh, the answer to the anthropological machine, or if, if this analysis is correct, that these normative accounts of what counts as human uh, in contrast to what counts as animal end up producing uh, racialized, colonial, uh, sexist, uh, and ableist hierarchies. Um, Jackson here makes the point that inclusion is not the answer. Uh, inclusivity is not the answer. She writes, recognition of personhood and humanity does not annul the animalization of blackness. Animalization is not incompatible with humanization. Uh, think of the zone of indistinction here. What is commonly deemed dehumanization is in the main more accurately interpreted as the violence of humanization or the burden of inclusion into a racially hierarchized universal humanity. Racialization and animalization are mutually constitutive forms of violence under slavery. Um, so what's so important about this is she's saying that it's not enough to sort of lift, uh, lift black people out of the burden or out from underneath the burden of animalization into full humanity. Because the idea of humanity that we're working with is already constitutively white supremacist, is already distorted, is all, already a product of the anthropological machine. That, that in, incorporation or inclusion into this distorted uh, notion of humanity is, is part of the problem. That in, in the zone of indistinction, um, humanization on the model of the anthropological machine is just the flip side of animalization and they, and they go together, they fit together. So what's needed is uh, a different understanding of humanity or a different way of, of thinking humanity entirely. Uh, a way of, as Agamben says, uh, jamming the anthropological machine. Um, so uh, to return, to uh, the, the Christian tradition here uh, and, and theology. The mainstream Christian tradition has assumed, uh, has often sort of built on the anthropological machine or worked through the anthropological machine and has assumed that God is the sort of original author of anthropological exceptionalism. Uh, that is that we image God through our distinctness from animals. We're like God because we're not like the animals. The image of God sets us apart. Or that the work of divine grace as God uh, approaches uh, and embraces humanity heightens our distinctness from other animals. Um, uh, sort of puts the foot on the accelerator of the anthropological machine, makes us more different. And alongside that assumption has been the idea that where animality uh, appears in human life, it's, it's a temporary and accidental provision. It's something to be disciplined or sublimated or um, condemned ultimately. And there's all kinds of strategies for that. Here's a couple, a couple examples. I, I, love, I love this quote from a fourth century bishop uh, in Asia Minor, what we call a what, what we call Turkey, uh, Gregory of Nyssa. And he's uh, preaching a series of homilies on the Song of Songs, which if you're not familiar is uh, erotic poetry in, in the Hebrew scriptures. And so he's, 
he's trying to introduce uh, these sexy themes to his congregation in a way that's not going to leave them scandalized. Uh, and but he does this, uh, and this this metaphor carries throughout the homilies with uh, a version of the anthropological machine. Because without a spiritual interpretation, scripture is like somebody setting out unprepared grain on the table for humans to eat without threshing the stock, reducing the grain to fl flour, making bread. So then just as unprepared produce is food for animals and not for human beings, so too one may say that the divinely inspired words, not only of the old covenant, but also the greater part of the gospel teaching are food for non-rational animals rather than for, a rational, for rational persons, unless they've been prepared by a properly subtle and discerning inquiry. So he want, he's encouraging his congregation to sort of read past the sexy parts of the Song of Songs or read uh, through the sexy parts of the Song of Songs without actually, um, without actually uh, inciting any of their animal desires, but sublimating those desires uh, and uh, redirecting them towards God. And what's fascinating to me is at the, at the very moment that he is uh, attempting to uh, extract humanity out of animality or abject animality beneath humanity, uh, it's, it's desire that is, it's this animal desire that uh, the Song of Songs uh, instigates through all of this sexy language that draws a person up to God. Uh, so divine grace, in and through scripture uses our desire, our animality, uh, although Gregory will never call it that, to draw us into relationship with God. So there's this really interesting tension or contradiction. Um, uh, another example, um, Thomas Aquinas, when uh, Aquinas uh, imagines the life of the resurrection, he asks himself a question, will we need to eat? And, and what happens to our sexy parts? Uh, what happens to, to human genitals in the resurrection? And he gives first the answer that we're, we will actually have our intestines and, uh, and our parts won't fall off. But the life of the resurrection, he thinks, uh, the life of human beings as they're united to the life of God is a life in which there is no longer any need for animal life. We won't need to eat, sleep, drink, beget, uh, all of those animal parts, they will not be in the resurrection. And this, despite the fact that the, the tradition's major metaphors for understanding life with God are uh, the messianic banquet, uh, the feast of the lamb, the culmination of the Eucharist, uh, which is a foretaste of the feast to come. The, the main metaphor for life with God is very much a, an eating metaphor. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see animality return here. Um, so a lot of the book takes this sort of traditional assumption that divine grace works in and through what makes us distinct as human beings uh, and attempts a kind of reversal of that assumption by attending to contradictions within it. I'm trying to jam the anthropological machine for a moment by attending to the operation of divine grace uh, in all of the attributes and capacities that link us to uh, what I sometimes call a common creaturely life, the ways that we share life in common with uh, our animal kin. And that's, I wanna be careful here because I wanna be, I wanna preserve a little, enough room to say that uh, this list of attributes that we've probably got animals wrong here. Um, that this is not a sort of, that any possible list of qualities that we would attribute to animality is not uh, necessarily an accurate or helpful or descriptive list. But what I do want to insist on or think, think through is what happens if we reverse our usual assumptions and think about God at work in our lives, not in the things that we think set us apart from the rest of creation, but in the things that we think that we think, whether we're right or not, link us to the rest of creation. So that the work of divine grace, um, the, the coming to earth uh, 
of God in a, in a human body uh, knits us more deeply into the fabric of creation rather than extracting us out of it or uh, transforming us uh, such that we, we no longer belong here. And if we're gonna build a new culture out of the fragments of our current culture, um, I think there's a lot of the theological tradition that needs to be, um, needs to be rethought, <laughs> needs to be uh, torn apart in many ways. But I think in the fragments, in the tensions, in the contradictions, there's a lot to think with uh, and is a good place to start on that project of large scale cultural transformation. So thank you all. I'll I'll stop uh, I'll stop the monologue and uh, uh, hope to uh, uh, move into a dialogue. Um, well, <clears throat> Eric, that was just absolutely. Can I use the word delicious? Uh, <laughs> it seems like I almost have to, right? Uh, since. Um, it, it names something that you're trying to do here, namely to, to reconnect us with, with uh, taste and eating and bodies. And uh, so uh, when we use this phrase intellectual feast, don't we? Uh, which still keeps with us our animality. And uh, that certainly counted what you just offered. And of course, uh, for those of us who've read your book, uh, this is just a sampling. Of, of a much larger um, and intriguing project. So thank you. Um, thank you for getting us going. So I will just wanna ask us a, a couple of questions. Uh, again, I, I wanna thank you for the treasure trove of the talk and your, and your book. Um, the whole book is an attempt to stop treating our engagements with animals and animality as any kind of niche subject at all, because we've always been thinking about humanity, animality, and divinity together. I think even in this talk, you succeed in showing us just how entangled these topic topics are. Uh, and that's really a rich gift. I think one recurring feature of your writing is just um, how topsy-turvy uh, your thinking appears to be in the light of how theology usually proceeds. Uh, consider, for example, how we talk about the idea of sin. Uh, you show in your chapter on sin that we repeatedly and constantly talk about sinfulness in association with animality. To be sinful is to be beastly, brutish, and animal-like. So if we're to avoid sin, we're to avoid, suppress, or even extinguish what is animal-like about us. But you, you want to completely overturn that and suggest quite the opposite, that to overcome sin is to become more, not less animal-like. And that's, that's fabulous. Uh, and it accounts for and gives a bit of an explanation for what might otherwise be seen as a kind of vaguely menacing title to the book, you know, the end of the human. So... Uh, could you say a little bit about that, that, that desire to turn the tables on the very core way we think about what sin is uh, with respect to animality and how it means an end to the human? Yeah. Um, <laughs> lots of thoughts all at once. The, the, the subtitle of the book is, is a little bit ominous and is a little bit threatening and uh, is a little bit playful and is, is also the product of uh, at least a month long back and forth with the editors on <laughs> at Fordham University Press on what the, the right subtitle would be. And uh, it ended up, uh, it feels a little dramatic, but, I'll, but, I, but I've, come to, I've come to like it quite a bit. Um, and what I would, what I would say, I'd, I'd almost, it, it wouldn't work as well as a subtitle and the editors would have had a fit about it again, but I'd rather talk about the end of humanity, um, the end of uh, this sort of anthropological machine or the, uh, this attempt to raise ourselves above the rest of creation. Um, 
And so to think about to think about that, on on one hand, I think that you're you're very much right that what I'm doing here is a reversal um, and is a topsy turvy uh, uh, flipping of the ways that we usually talk about sin as as falling down. Even the metaphor of the fall is falling down into animality often, where that's the that's what theologians reach for when they go to explain the fall. Um, on the other hand, I think there's a lot in there that is deeply traditional. So Augustine, uh, Augustine gets sometimes gets in trouble for thinking about pride as, as the sort of heart of, of original sin, that original sin is our attempt to sort of be like God and raise ourselves up above our proper station. Um, and he gets critiqued, and rightly so, by feminist theologians who say, well, this sort of uh, egocentric version of the self is a very masculine, is a very masculine form of sin or that sort of thing. Um, and I, th I think that's a helpful and important argument. But I guess one way of reading what I'm doing in the book is, is actually just taking that a little bit further and saying like, well, if, if we really think that pride and self-centeredness and raising ourselves above our station is at the heart of original sin, why don't we ever take that down to our relationship with other animals? Um, and then, you know, it is, uh, I meant to say this at the beginning, it's, it is genuinely such an honor to, to get to speak at Union Seminary because so many um, of my guiding theological lights have, have been in those halls. Uh, James Cohn and uh, um, uh, Roger Haight and uh, so many. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who spent time at, at Union, and uh, the folks who are at Union are probably sick of hearing all of these people. Um, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer has this wonderful short little book called Creation and Fall, where he doesn't quite carry out the reading to the extent that I have, but he's, he's pretty suggestive that uh, the fall is a sort of raising ourselves up and uh, is a breakdown of those, of those relationships. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm using some theorists that don't get used very often within the Christian, within contemporary Christian theology, but I, in many ways, I'm, I'm just trying to extend those ideas uh, and uh, and suggest that, yeah, our, our attempt to be human at the expense of the rest of creation is, is the substance of the fall and that salvation actually take, might take our humanity away. Uh, another um, brilliant feature of the book, and I and you talked about it this in your in your talk, um, is the way it works with and leverages contradictions that uh, run right through the heart of the tradition, mm -hmm. and uh, that's really playful and intellectually energizing. Um, for example. You spoke about this remarkable contradiction that, that arguably all of Christian life is about eating. Mm -hmm. It's centered around the Eucharist. It's a bodily act. You know, you, you can't just theorize about it. You, mm -hmm. To be part of the Christian community is to eat the Eucharist. And then you show, as you said in the talk, that presumably that stops. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it stops in the time or the world to come. Uh, I, I loved the way you, you, you use those kinds of contradictions to suggest that the tradition is, in a way, at war with itself on very fundamental theological features. And it isn't until we get to an unmask and unearth uh, those deep contradictions, sometimes ludicrous contradictions, um, that we can win our way into a kind of different theological future. Um, so I, I'm just inviting you to, you know, um, say a, a bit more. I mean, what can you talk about, you know, a couple more of these contradictions that you think we have to sort of pressure and play with and break? In order to uh, in order to do theologic 
theological reflection differently. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one, the one that uh, is just a, a great example of what you were just talking about, I think it's um, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa's older brother, who comes up with the idea that um, Jesus never defecated uh, because that would have been beneath, that would have been beneath the dignity of, uh, of God incarnate uh, to, and, and he says, well, Jesus' digestive system being God incarnate was just so well-tuned that he, he didn't produce any waste. He used food entirely. Uh, and it's this attempt to sanitize Jesus and, uh, and sanctify Jesus. And what's, I guess what's, what's really interesting to me about that or attention there is now, this is at the time of a lot of the Christological arguments, there's big worries about whether uh, it's okay to talk about God's suffering uh, in Jesus on the cross um, or uh, whether it's okay to talk about Mary as the mother of God. Because does God need a mother? Well, and, and isn't it beneath God's dignity to dwell in a womb? Uh, and be born. And the, the orthodox, the mainstream response to that is uh, over and over again, we don't need to protect God from humanity in ways that God was not, uh, that God didn't protect himself. Like we remember Jesus as fully human. Uh, the definition of Chalcedon says homoousius with us uh, in, in our humanity. Um, but the, that impulse in the tradition just stops. <laughs> it's, it stops at our sort of proper humanity it, it's, and doesn't, doesn't pass through that zone of indistinction to the point at which we share a common creaturely life with the rest of creation. At best, you get a lot of theologians talking about human beings as a kind of fulcrum through which God saves the rest of the, the rest of creation but not sort of seeing us in, in our relationships to the rest of, to, to other creatures. And I, and I, I mean, I just think that that's, I think that's a mistake and, and it would be better to follow that impulse all the way through. God's not afraid to be an animal um, with us. Uh, and maybe uh, in the incarnation, what's going on is less a kind of divine stamp of approval on humanity in, in the ways that we like to think about ourselves, like, look, we're so special, God became one of us, and more a, uh, an intervention. God is worried that we're, out of, that we're out of control, and he's gotta become one of us to talk us out of it. He's gotta get down on our level to help us sort of integrate ourselves back into creation. Um, and that, so that, you know, that seems like an, there's an opening there for a theology that moves in that direction that um, has been there from the fifth century on. It just uh, needs people to come along and, and think it. I now better appreciate why you're eager to sort of make clear that you know, you're not some radically heterodox theologian. There, there just are these mm -hmm. sites of enormous promise in the tradition. It's just that we, we don't look to them uh, and we can't because in part um, how we read the tradition is so captive to what you call the anthropological machine, the manufacture of uh, and containment of animality uh, from us and therefore also from God. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's just great. One, one last question for me and I, I hope it doesn't, uh, sound too basic. It's just a big basic question. Um, so help us to think about how, about the bet you've made. You've made a bet that rupturing the anthropological machine is integral to arresting the crisis we're in. Um, why, right? So this is just the big question of the book. Um, 
of the of the entire project. You know, why is that so essential? And then the the less sort of grandiose, but still a big question is, the book seems to worry about whether it can be interrupted at all, mm-hmm. because the, the machine uh, and hege- any kind of hegemony is so deeply in us, mm-hmm. structuring our, our very categories and the way we think that the anthropological machine is just you know, it's it's a beast haha, uh, of a negative sort. See, right? This is an example yeah. out, out of which you cannot escape. Yeah. Um, so you 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 are convinced that we have to break it, and you're worried about whether it's breakable. So uh, I'd love to hear a bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I like. So, you know, the, the idea of the anthropological machine again comes from Agamben uh, and he, you know, so it's this, I, I find it helpful as a metaphor because it's this sort of, uh, it's a mechanism. And so it helps, it helps us think about the relationship between uh, individuals and structures. Like it's not, it's not like I'm doing, I'm doing the anthropological machine. I'm caught up in this sort of, process or, or, or mechanism that keeps on going. And I guess what, one of the things that I think is, is interesting about the way that Agamben talks about solving the problem, because he, he, uh, he makes some pretty strong claims that, uh, that the anthropological machine is a, is a sort of bigger problem than any other question of justice we might raise, which seems, um, seems provocative and maybe out of place and maybe inappropriate. Um, but he, when he talks about undoing or solving the problem, he talks about jamming the, the anthropological machine or just stopping it for a minute. Uh, and I, and I, think, I think that's helpful. We don't actually have another way to understand ourselves. Um, we don't have a self-understanding we can't escape our language. We can't escape our cultural formation. Um, and to presume that we could would be naive and romantic. Um, let, me, let me make another analogy. So sometimes within uh, environmentalism and within especially critical animal studies, there's a sort of rightly a celebration of indigenous cultures um, as uh, bearing wisdom from which we desperately need to learn. And I, and I think that's true. Sometimes that slips into uh, a dangerous appropriation or a romantic sense that somehow I, as a 39 year old white guy, if I dress up in my ideal version of a Native American, that I could somehow get back to uh, a lost. Native American culture. And I think that would be a mistake for, for a lot of reasons. It would be culturally insensitive. It would be, and, and we don't live, even the Blackfeet who live uh, near me do not and cannot live as the Blackfeet did 200 years ago. So where do we go from here? Or how do we build out of the fragment of our culture um, a culture that can be, can actually inhabit relationships of reciprocity and kinship um, with other animals. And, and, I, and I think it takes a sort of stopping this process of trying to set ourselves apart from all the other animals in order to, in order to you know, who knows what it will look like, but it's a, it's a, it's a crack. Another world is possible. I don't know what it, I don't know what it will look like, and, but we, we need to do the work to get there. And nostalgia isn't going to be helpful. Appropriation isn't going to be helpful. But maybe in the fragments of our own culture, we can find seeds to, uh, of a different way of doing things. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the very rich questions we have. Um, let me begin with a, a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, 
Whether it's fair to blame religion as the cause of anthropological exceptionalism, when much of the ancient texts and writers that exceptionalism is rooted in had a worldview in which religion was inseparable with every sphere of life. So there's, it's an interesting question because it, it gets to the religion, non-religion binary. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's also, I think, a question here as to whether we're overstating the role of religious traditions uh, as, as particularly responsible for this predicament. Yeah, and and I think I, I'm I'm sympathetic with that. Uh, yeah, what you know, uh, Brent Nongbri, I forget the title of the book, has a great book on the invention of religion, mm -hmm. and and as religion as an essentially Christian category. So like doing the work to think about where do we learn to call religion what we call religion? When did that start? Is is helpful work. Um, but given, given our place in the world now, I think it's, Lynn White makes this point at the end of that um, mm -hmm. historical roots essay that within the cultures of the West, at least, whether, whether people call themselves Christian or not, and, th and there's lots of people who don't, and, uh, and that's great. We live, we live in many ways in a post-Christian culture um, a, a culture that's formed by the impulses and values and histories of Christianity um, hegemonically. Um, uh, and so we don't even, I think we need to grapple with you know, whether or not people are, have a personal commitment to Christianity. I think there's an, a, a deeper need to grapple with what religion does in our world in terms of setting sort of setting our worldviews, even as they have been secularized. As I, I, you know, I guess my impulse would be along those lines with Lynn White to say uh, the, the solution will be basically religious, whether we call it that or not, mm -hmm. to, to trouble that boundary between what we think of as religion and, and not. Excellent. Oh, I see yeah, Matthew Dean pointing out that Lynn White is another union alum. Oh, I didn't, even I didn't know that, or if I did, I forgot. Uh, so, wow. Uh, so there's a question from Janae, if I'm pronouncing the name right, Salcido, uh, which asks, could you speak to how you've navigated the Christian cosmology and its relationship in upholding anthropological exceptionalism and also how the theology of transcendence may deter uh, folks from within the Christian tradition from being more active in non-human earth beings, extinctions, and the climate crisis. Yeah. Uh, uh, transcendence seems to be key to this question. Yeah, very much. And the, the, so the Lutheran theologian by the name of Paul Santmeyer makes a distinction between, um, forget whether it's theologies or spiritualities of transcendence uh, and theologies or spiritualities of fecundity. And I, uh, he's not using the same theoretical sources as I am, but he's calling attention to another tension or contradiction within the, the Christian tradition, that there are spiritualities and theologies that call us sacramentally to recognize the mystery of God in the everyday um, ordinary and see, you know, the the non-canonical gospel of Thomas, turn over any log, uh, turn over any rock, you'll find God there. Um, or G Gerard Manley Hopkins, the world is charged with the, the grandeur of God. But those are side by side with and in competition and tension with theologies of transcendence that ask us to, to get, on, get on the good spaceship Christ and, and leave creation behind uh, for a heavenly realm. Um, and so, I mean, my, I guess my strong impulse is to, and, and this, is, I don't, this is a sort of larger inclination of mine, is to stick with the Christian cosmology, but find the places where it breaks down and find, find the tensions and find the contradictions. And I, and I want to just pull back and emphasize the, the theology of fecundity and and show how the theology of transcendence sort of 
undermines itself. Um, so rather than pretend like I could leave the tradition behind, I want to read it carefully against itself. There are so many rich questions here, uh, and uh, picking any one makes uh, makes uh, makes for a painful choice because I'm leaving out so many others. Uh, Josh Connerty asks uh, an intriguing uh, question. Uh, Connerty writes, this is lovely. In the light of the centrality of food and eating within the Christian story, I wonder whether it might be helpful to highlight the biblical incarnation of Jesus, which has been traditionally located in another animal's feeding trough. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's very clever. Uh, and the question, how might we more faithfully hold the language of Imago Dei, which continues to be used to desecrate the other? Um, so, I mean, that's a very broad question. I mean, yeah. should, we, should we pitch Imago Dei? Uh, because it is, in, you know, traditionally used to highlight qualities on the left side of your list, like rationality over against passion or desire. Um, so is it, is it something that we have to retire from theology? Um, I, I remember some of you who are around Union may know Jan Janine Hill Fletcher at Fordham. And I wrote in my, uh, in my doctoral work at one point, she just asked, she asked me point blank, why don't, why don't we just throw out Genesis 1 and 2? <laughs> um, <laughs> wouldn't it be easier if we just got rid of these chapters? Uh, and, uh, you know, as soon as somebody comes along and puts me in charge of the universe, maybe we can do that. Um, but my inclination is not to not to get rid of the Imago Dei. I think it's important to do the historical and genealogical work to see how the idea has been used destructively over and over again. And I think there's there's a lot of different possible responses. Um, there's, a, there's a good historical critical response that would say that in its, in its historical context, this idea is bringing dignity to a very degraded people, not setting people uh, above as rulers of the earth. Um, I think my first impulse would be uh, to follow, in that book I mentioned earlier, um, creation and fall, Bonhoeffer pays attention to a tension between Genesis, the first creation story and the second creation story. And the, the first creation story culminates with, well, actually with the Sabbath of God. Uh, but before that, with hum, human beings, male and female, made in God's image. Um, the apex of creation, sometimes, we would like to say. Uh, in the second creation story, there's, it shows up a few times, uh, the serpent tempts Adam and Eve with the fruit saying, eat, eat of this and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Um, and uh, they do. And then at the very end of chapter three, God says, oh, look, the problem, they've become like us. Um, and so I think that's a sort of real close, helpful counterbalance that there's, maybe there's a way of being like God that is good and, and should be lifted up, but we need to always set that alongside a way of being like God that's a problem, that is maybe the, the problem. Um, and that opens up room to think about um, imaging God more broadly, that maybe the image of God is not an exclusive human quality, but is a, we image God in a human way and uh, God's goodness and love uh, and justice is reflected through, uh, through other creatures in their own unique ways as well, so that we bear an image of God, but not the image of God. Excellent. I think we may have time for one more. Uh, Shola asks, um, can you say a bit more about the way humans suppress human animality? You had mentioned taming, totemization, etc. 
Totems in my mind is a way of positively affirming a human relationship to animals. I don't understand how it fits human over animal hegemony. Yeah. Um, so, and that's, yeah, and, and I'd, I'd like to think a little bit further with that. I think what I'm, what I'm thinking about there especially are, um, there's a Russian Orthodox Saint, Saint, Saint Seraphim of Sarah, who uh, in the stories uh, lives, lives way out in the woods to pray and uh, develops a relationship with a bear. And the bear comes to recognize his holiness. Um, or some uh, ancient North African Christian stories from the deserts of Egypt, where uh, some of the earliest monks uh, have no one to bury. The ground is too hard for them to dig a grave for their companion. And a couple lions run along and, and recognize the holiness of, of the saint and, and, uh, and dig a grave. And there's a kind of um, identification with those animals uh, that humanizes them, or I think to some degree sort of inserts them within the anthropological machine uh, and turns them into, um, you know, turns them into something that they're not, that anthropomorphizes them uh, so that you, you end up in a lot of the in a lot of Christian literature, animals are either sort of uh, avenues for recognizing human holiness, and in that sense, sort of totems of, of human ideas, or they're vicious, dangerous, beastly creatures. But they're never, they're uh, either way, we're not. And what's missing there is a sort of relationship of reciprocity. Um, they, they come to stand for something else. No, that's a great question. Yeah, uh, I, oh, okay, I'm gonna sneak one more in. Uh, Lynn McFarland asked a, a question that seems to really um, be steeped in some sophisticated work in biology and animal studies and pushes us to think about the reptilian mammalian distinction. Uh, and then using that asks whether some instincts might serve as the base for our human community, even beloved community, uh, specifically mammalian care as the root of love or play as the root of imagination. Yeah. Uh, striking question. Do you see that in the tradition? Um, no, I'm sure it's there somewhere. Um, and um, let's see. Marjorie Suhaki comes close in a book. Uh, I'm not going to remember the title of the book, but um, but yes, I love I love I love that question. Um, and I think I think so often the way that we unpack, you know, what it, what is love in the Christian tradition? Um, well, the highest the highest form of love is supposed to be agape love that is disinterested and free and self-giving and um, not instinct basic basically not instinctual it's it's love that all the animal animality has been rinsed out of um, or it gets explained that way and and I I love the question because I think uh, <laughs> you know, what is yeah what is the bond what what is the bond between Jesus and Mary? between the mother of God and the, and the son of, well, it has to be a, a mammalian bond. Uh, and if, if we are to love one another, it, it seems to me that it's done well in and through our capacity to bond with one another. Um, and that, I mean, that can be manipulated and can, uh, can get distorted, but um, the pandemic is painful because we, we, need to hug and to shake hands and to kiss one another on the cheek and, and all of these things that are, um, whether or not we 
recognize them as that or not, but we bond with our bodies to one another, even in friend, even in friendship and even in professional relationships. And that's a, that I, again, that, that line can be blurred in ways that are um, harmful and distorting. And I, and I don't mean, I don't mean to sort of sanction abuse in any sense, but it, but there are ways in which our, um, our bonds our animal bonds, and we, if we recognize them as that, we would be more honest with ourselves. Well, thank you for a truly rich um, time together. Uh, Christopher Fici will now share um, a, uh, what's coming up next week in our time with uh, Jake Erickson. Hey. Chris, if you're there. Now would be a good time to share that. As you can see, another uh, rich and uh, compelling topic. So we very much hope that all of you will uh, be able to join us and return to talk about uh, really one of the, the deep questions, uh, how to manage our grief uh, in an age of extinction. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to that, uh, that conversation. Finally, let me conclude by again, thanking Eric, uh, Chris, and behind the scenes, Ian Reese, who does a lot of our work um, with respect to the tech and uh, publicity. We're thankful to so many. And of course, uh, Mary Coelho for making all of this possible. Thank you. And we hope to see you next week. <laughs>